In this service of Lent, the place of the Passion is Pilate's judgment hall, where Pilate is positioned here to set Jesus free, but turns him over to be crucified instead. We are called to remember that the judgment that should have been placed on us was placed on him that we might be free. The meaning, history, and spiritual inspiration associated with Pilate's judgment hall help us to grow to understand more deeply the hard road our Lord took that the way to heaven might be open to us. Our theme passage for this service is Matthew 27, verse 22. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us ever walk with Jesus to see the depths of his love, to behold the gift of his forgiveness, to gaze upon the heights of his grace, to marvel at the magnitude of his mercy. We walk with Jesus to Pilate's judgment hall, to hear about Jewish leaders, a prisoner named Barabbas, and even Pilate's wife. It all boils down to three words, innocent, guilty, and free. Faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow where you guide. Let us ever walk with Jesus, follow his example pure, through a world that would deceive us and to sin our spirits lure. Onward in his footsteps treading, pilgrims here our home above, full of faith and hope and love, let us do the Father's bidding. Faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow where you guide. Let us suffer here with Jesus, and with patience bear our cross. Joy will follow all our sadness. Where he is, there is no loss. Though today we sow no laughter, we shall reap celestial joy. All discomforts that annoy shall give way to mirth hereafter. Jesus, here I share your woe. Help me there your joy to know. Forgiving Father, though I don't like to admit it, I am a sinner, much like Barabbas, a rebel and a wretch, born dead in transgressions and sins, lost and without hope doomed to perish, blinded by the God of this age. My finest deeds are still soiled with sin, and all my righteous acts are like unclean rags. I am Barabbas. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Hear the good news. Jesus walked to places of rejection, suffering, torment, and death for you. Jesus was determined to go to Gethsemane, Gabbatha, and Golgotha for you. That's why Jesus forgives you completely and loves you eternally. Faithful Lord, with me abide. I shall follow where you guide. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you set Israel free from the chains of Egyptian bondage, and you set Barabbas free from Roman execution. So set us free from every prison that shackles and binds us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our gospel reading for today is taken from Matthew 27, verses 11 through 23. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. 
But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now, at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. What's the most famous trial in the last 100 years? Was it the 1925 Scopes Monkey Trial in Dayton, Tennessee, after which our nation allowed evolution to be taught in public schools? Was it the Nuremberg Trials, when leaders of Hitler's Nazi Germany confessed their World War II atrocities? Was it the old O.J. Simpson trial with the famous black glove? Was it the Timothy McVeigh trial? McVeigh, you may remember, was tried for killing 168 people in Oklahoma City on April 19, 1995. Or maybe you're thinking about the Unabom. Unabomber trial, the Saddam Hussein trial, or perhaps even the Martha Stewart trial. What are the most important words in any trial? Innocent, guilty, and free. Every trial hinges on these three words, innocent, guilty, and free. Let's use these words to understand the most famous trial ever, one for the ages. The trial takes place in Pilate's judgment hall. The accused, Jesus. The accusers, the Jewish leaders. The judge, Pontius Pilate. Innocent, guilty, free. Innocent, that's Jesus. For Pilate knew that it was out of envy that the Sanhedrin had delivered Jesus up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Six times in his passion narrative, Matthew calls Pontius Pilate the governor. As Judea's governor, Pilate is sitting on the judgment seat. That's because Pilate has the power of imperium. That's the Latin word for the person who decides formal death penalty cases. In Judea, Pilate alone has the power of imperium. You live or die according to Pilate. Jesus is innocent. Pilate doesn't completely understand it. But Pilate's wife understands it. Ha! You women say, even then, women were smarter than men. Pilate's wife knows Jesus is innocent. The rest of the New Testament takes this further, a whole lot further. The New Testament says Jesus is absolutely and perfectly innocent. For example, Hebrews 4 verse 15 says, Jesus was without sin. 
Jesus could have broken bread with the devil in the wilderness or broken ranks with the Father in Gethsemane, but he didn't. Jesus was perfect, always honest in the midst of lies, relentlessly kind in a world of hatred and self-centeredness, heavenly focused in spite of countless distractions. When it came to sin, Jesus never did it. Innocent. That's Jesus. Guilty? That's Barabbas. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Barabbas was a Jewish Robin Hood. Barabbas took money from rich Romans and gave it to poor Jews. That made Barabbas a Jewish superstar. Barabbas was famous as an insurrectionist. Insurrectionists were anti-Roman fighters who belonged to a political group called Zealots. And Zealots had one agenda. Get Rome out of Judea, period. Zealots were ready to do anything to make that happen, even slit throats. Barabbas wasn't a petty thief or a second-hand scoundrel. Rome wouldn't condemn a small-time crook to crucifixion. Rome would, however, execute a notorious insurrectionist, a first-class killer. That was Barabbas. He was a heartless, brutal criminal. Barabbas had anger in his heart and blood on his hands. Barabbas would be crucified by noon, dead by sundown. His only future was a hammer, three nails, and a god-awful death by hanging on a cross. Innocent? That's Jesus. Guilty? That's Barabbas. Guilty? That's us for sure. We're all born dead in transgressions and sins. We are lost. Prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We are blinded by the God of this age and hopeless. Our finest deeds are dung or rubbish and manure and unclean rags. Just call us Barabbas. Paul puts it this way in Romans 7, verse 24. What a wretched man I am. Not I was a wretch. No, I am a wretch. Paul uses a present tense verb. Right now, today, as a believer, truth be told, I'm still a wretch. The Bible calls it sin. Sin isn't a regrettable regrettable lapse or an occasional stumble. Sin stages a, a coup against God's rule. Sin storms the castle. Sin lays claim to God's sovereign throne. Sin defies God's universal authority. Sin says, get out, God. Get lost, God. I'm in charge here, God. It's easy in church to want to live in peace with all people. It's harder, however, to act on that when you didn't get promoted at work because you didn't have the right connections. It's easy in church to want to help the poor, but it's hard to do that when you see a new flat screen TV. Besides, you work so hard for your money. It's easy in church to say one thing and then go into the world and do the exact opposite. The prophet says in Isaiah 53, verse 6, We all, like sheep, have gone astray, and each of us has turned to his own way. You have your way, I have my way. Your way may be accumulation of stuff. Her way may be intoxication. His way may be flirtation. We all have turned to our own way, just like sheep. I don't like to confess it. In fact, I'd just as soon avoid it. I'm Barabbas. I'm a prisoner to my past, my low road choices, and my high-minded pride. 
God has declared me guilty. What's his sentence? Romans 6 verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. Death. Let that sink in. Innocent? That's Jesus. Guilty? That's Barabbas. Guilty? That's us. Free? That's Barabbas. Now, the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. The word persuaded, rendered a past tense verb, is better translated here as a past perfect tense verb. Had persuaded. What's the difference? The Sanhedrin had all their ducks in row long before this early morning trial. Had persuaded. Meaning what? Meaning this crowd is different from the crowd on Palm Sunday. The Palm Sunday crowd consisted of Galileans. The crowd on Good Friday consisted of Judeans, up at 6 a.m. to get Barabbas off the hook. The Galileans are camped outside of Jerusalem, still sleeping. Listen, can you hear him? It's the Roman guard with the key. He unlocks the prison door, swings it open, and shouts, Barabbas, you're free! They chose you to go free! Barabbas stumbles into the light of day. Shackles gone. Crimes pardoned. Free. Free. That's Barabbas. Free. That's us, for sure. How so? Christ endured not just the Roman nails, the mockery, and the spear, but also the gears of God's grinding justice. The gears of God's grinding justice? Really? Yes, really. God doesn't overlook sin. God doesn't say, hey, no big deal. That's not how it works. God is holy, righteous, and perfect. God can't overlook sin. God must punish sin. That's why God placed all our sin on Jesus. It's accurate, therefore, to say Christ substituted himself for the world. It's life-changing, however, to say Christ substituted himself for me. My sins? They are many. God's mercy? It is more, so much more. We're free The Lord sets prisoners free. The law of the Spirit of life has set you free. It is for the freedom that Christ has set us free. Jesus has freed us from our sins by his blood. There are a million ways to become a prisoner. There is only one way to be free. His name is Jesus. Just think. The outcome of history's most famous trial means that the Savior's liberating power sets us free from the condemnation of our sin, free from the pain of our past, free from worry about our future. No one can take this freedom from us. No law can stop it. And no power on earth or hell can destroy it. Innocent, guilty, and free. These are the most important words in any trial. What would you say is the most life-changing of the three? Innocent? Guilty? Free? That's easy. Free. John 8 verse 36 says, If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's us, like Barabbas, by faith, forever free, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Onward in Christ's footsteps treading, pilgrims here our home above. Full of faith and hope and love, let us do the Father's bidding. And so we pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you freed us from the delusion of trying to earn and maintain a relationship with you, from the anxiety of wondering what you think about us, from the chains of condemnation and from fear of death. That's why we rejoice to say, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Dear Lord Jesus, only your mercy and grace can help us see, receive, and trust our gospel freedoms. Send us your word and spirit so that we live by the truth. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Dear Lord Jesus, free us from being arrogant, aggravated, and annoyed with people. Turn our angry reactions into slower and kinder responses. Help us use fewer words and listen more. Send us your word and spirit so that we share this truth with the world. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Dear Lord Jesus, unshackle the chains of our lingering doubts and insecurities. Empower us to throw off the grave clothes of shame and feelings of failure. Heal our wounds and free us from bitterness. Send us your word and spirit so that we reflect this truth. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Dear Lord Jesus, free us for larger hearts toward the lost, more mercy for doubters, and lavish love for all people. May our spouses feel cherished and appreciated, our children secure and our loved ones treasured and valued. Jesus, let me faithful be, life eternal, grant to me. Amen. Together we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Jesus invites us to walk with him to Pilate's judgment hall, a place of great suffering and a place of great love. We will walk with Jesus all the way to the empty tomb and resurrection victory. Let us ever walk with Jesus. Alas, and did my Savior bleed? And did my Sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Was it for sins that I had done he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. Well might the sun in darkness hide and shut his glories in, when God, the mighty maker, died for his own creature's sin. Thus might I hide my blushing face, while his dear cross appears, dissolve my heart in thankfulness, and melt mine eyes to tears. But drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away, tis all that I can do. <laughs> 